Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Wildermuth. I'm the Dean here at Pitt Law, and I am delighted to extend a very warm welcome to all of you joining us today for the Mark A. Nordenberg Lecture in Law, Medicine, and Psychiatry. This lectureship series was established in 2000 by Dr. Thomas Dietrich, the former Senior Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences and former Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry here at Pitt to bring the University of Pittsburgh campus outstanding experts in the fields of law, medicine, and psychiatry who could address some of the most difficult and complex issues confronting both of these disciplines in contemporary society. Recent lectures have presented on topics such as confidentiality in medical records, the effectiveness of involuntary outpatient commitment and the insanity defense in the 21st century. Today, we welcome Professor Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Pearson Brown will, will more formally introduce her, but let me again thank Professor Goodwin for joining us and for being here today. I am so looking forward to your lecture. I also wanna offer my deepest gratitude to all the people responsible for this terrific event. I believe Mark Nordenberg is joining us today. Hi, Mark. We're so delighted to have this lecture in your name. We are also very pleased to have Professor Crossley leading us in this charge, along with Professor Pearson Brown. We also have the terrific Beth Ann Pischke, Deb Hilton, Corey Paris and Kim Getz, who have helped us every step of the way. So thank you to everyone who, has, who have made this possible. And I am gonna now turn it over to Professor Pearson Brown. Thank you, everyone. And good afternoon. Um, as Dean Amy has introduced me, I am uh, Professor Pearson Brown. I'm the director of the Health Law Clinic at the Pitt Law. And I'm also the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusive Excellence. And I have the esteemed honor of introducing this year's Mark A. Nordenberg lecturer, Dr. Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. Following Dr. Goodwin's remarks, there will be a Q&A session. So I encourage you to enter any questions that you might have during the lecture into the Q&A function. And I will be moderating questions at the conclusion of Dr. Goodwin's remarks. Dr. Goodwin is a chancellor's professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law and founding director of the school's Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. She is an elected member of the American Law Institute, as well as an elected fellow of the American Bar Association and the Hastings Center, the organization central to the founding of the field of bioethics. Dr. Goodwin is the first law professor at the University of California, Irvine to receive the 2020-2021 Distinguished Senior Faculty Award for Research, the highest honor bestowed by the University of California. Dr. Goodwin writes at the intersection of law, society, and global health. Her publications include five books and over a hundred law review articles, book chapters, and commentaries. Her opinion editorials and commentaries have appeared in the New York Times, the LA Times, Salon.com, Politico, and Forbes Magazine, to name a few. She is also the host of the popular Ms. Mag Ms. Magazine podcast on the issues with Michelle Goodwin, one of my personal favorites. Dr. Goodwin's most recent book, Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, details the covert surveillance tactics targeting pregnant women. She deftly explores the use of law to criminalize women for miscarriages, stillbirths, and for conduct framed as threatening the health of their pregnancies. Her research exposes the willingness of state actors to privilege political gain over the lives, rights, and dignity of pregnant women in the United States. For poor pregnant women of color, institutional racism and sexism and classism intersect in ways that criminalize their experiences and negate their reproductive freedoms. Goodwin writes that it is not simply the criminalization of pregnancy that disempowers and renders women's lives politically invisible, 
It is the glaringly high maternal death rates that exceed all other developed nations, the rise in pregnancy exclusion laws, which override brain dead patients' medical directives, and the anti-abortion measures that allow no exceptions for rape and incest. In Goodwin's incisive account, these devastating trends reduce pregnant women to chattel. In the United States, pregnancy, especially among the poor, has become a political landmine, a trigger for state surveillance and criminalization with severe extralegal consequences. Dr. Goodwin's body of work shines an important light on the institutional forces actively working to reify racial and gender oppression. Her message reminds us all, lawyer, ethicist, scientist, physician, or voter, that the realization of social justice is dependent upon how we use our voice. And friends, the next voice that you will hear is that of Dr. Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. Won't you join me in welcoming her? Thank you so much, Professor Pearson Brown, for that very generous introduction. And thank you, Dean Wildermuth, for uh, the just generosity uh, in extending this invitation today uh, to me and also Professor Crossley. Uh, for reaching out. It's my pleasure and honor to give this lecture today, which is on my uh, recent book, Policing the Womb, um, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, right here. <laughs> and today's lecture, I want to start off with historical context and content. The book itself provides a journey through uh, where we are today in terms of reproductive health rights and justice and the state's intervention in the lives of people who can become pregnant and the ways in which law has rendered uh, women's constitutional rights um, invisible and rendered women uh, sometimes invisible uh, in the process. And so let me talk a little bit about what I mean and start off with some historical content. There's much buzz today uh, around the terminology of reproductive justice. People are beginning to understand that uh, when we are talking about reproductive health and rights, that those are incomplete lenses through which to evaluate and to think about the whole person and the personhood of women and people who can become a pregnant. That is to say that when abortion is at the forefront of how we understand reproductive rights, that there's much that we're missing. And what do I mean by that? If we were to think about a civil rights agenda, then we know that in a civil rights agenda, there was more than Brown v. Board of Education providing the ability and wherewithal for Black children to be able to be schooled with dignity and not suffer the harmful consequences of separate but equal policies that were born about post reconstruction. There was an understanding that a civil rights agenda had to encompass more than that because it had to encompass accommodations, housing, employment, the ability to be able to uh, walk through a park unfettered um, and not molested by police. Um, and so forth. And so a civil rights agenda, if we understand that correctly, we, we understand that it was broad. It included voting rights, right? Unfortunately, as we think about the reproductive rights space, much of the energy has been a, around abortion. Now, that's actually part of the book. I devote a chapter to it here. And it is really important that we remember exactly why uh, Roe v. Wade was decided as a seven to two opinion in 1973. And it's important to understand that of those seven justices that decriminalized abortion, that five of them were Republican appointed. And Justice Blackman, who wrote the opinion, was an appointee of Richard Nixon. And so situating history is really important as we think about the reproductive health rights space and justice. But I want to take us back before Roe v. Wade. 
to contextualize um, how I think we should understand uh, the, the space, the anatomy uh, of policing the womb. If we're to understand the anatomy of policing the womb, then let's think about Sojourner Truth and her famous speech, uh, which most people call the Ain't I a Woman speech. Now, many people record in their memory that speech as one being about chivalry. That is to say that they recall Sojourner Truth mentioning that Black women were not accorded the kind of niceties and chivalry um, that were expected and bestowed upon white women. She speaks about no one opening a carriage door for her. People remember that part of the speech. It is incredibly rare. Almost never do you hear what actually is a foregrounding of the speech, which she says, which is that I bore 13 children and nearly each one snatched from my arm and nobody heard my cry but God, ain't I a woman? And so if we think about the earliest vestiges of policing the womb, in the United States, it roots itself in American slavery. It roots itself in the pillaging of kidnapped and trafficked bodies. It roots itself in the earliest of American laws, disempowering, disenfranchising black women and their bodies. And let's be clear too, that in this landscape, it's one that pushes indigenous people off of their lands. It's not a kind environment. As it relates to the capitalist system that it will develop, it depends on black women's bodies for that. And so its earliest laws follow hypo descent. That is that one drop rule, right? One must ask, why is there such a thing in this country as the one drop rule? Well, our DNAs uh, expose why that becomes important. It exposes why laws in the 1600s were enacted that provided that children would take on the legal status of their mothers and not of their fathers. This is the intersection of policing wombs, capitalism, and the birth of America. The birth of America itself is exactly this. Last year, 23andMe released studies that it had done on the DNA of Black Americans. And what it found was something that we know about and that we whisper about, but now these genetic tests have revealed. And that is within the bodies of Black people lies the paternity of white men to a shocking and startling degree. But what do we make of this? And where did that come from? It comes from a space and time in which the pillaging of Black women's bodies, the surveilling of them, the treating of them with disregard and disdain was normalized both in public spaces, and I mean by public, by law, and also within the private, right, within homes. And so I should add one other layer too, as I sort of take us on a historical journey that gets us right up into these times, which is to say that the point at which we now have so much current debate with regard to abortion and even sterilization, if one thinks about the whistleblower case in Georgia very recently, um, uh, is the ability of individuals to be able to make determinations um, about whether to terminate a pregnancy or not. What Roe v. Wade teaches so many, but you could learn these lessons outside of Roe, which was that abortion had not been a crime in the United States um, early on. Pilgrims practiced uh, abortion and contraception. These were not issues um, that were in controversy in the law, but these were also times in which women controlled nearly 100% of women's reproductive health care. And if you think about it, right, millennia ago, there are no people 
roaming around uh, the you know continents of Asia or Africa with lab coats on and stethoscopes. Who were the people that were doing reproductive health care? They were women. But why is this important to the story and legacy? What does it relate to Sojourner Truth and the journey that I want to take you through? Which is to say that abortion becomes politicized around the time of the Civil War. Okay, right? And this is a really important matter to understand is it sort of gets at that space of intersectionality that you've heard talked about through the work of Kim Crenshaw, but that had been a part of the discourse of Sojourner Truth and so many scholars and others um, from the times of slavery throughout. And that is to say that there's a perfect storm that comes together in many ways around the time of the Civil War. It's the time in which there begins to be the professionalization um, of gynecology and obstetrics. It just cements during that time. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dr. Marion Sims, who's considered the grandfather of gynecology. But if you read his autobiography as I did, and there were statues of him all across the country, including in New York in Central Park, which was taken down very recently. If you read his autobiography, what you'll know is that uh, part of the professionalization and sort of getting that to that place of gynecology and obstetrics was in fact on the use of black women's bodies in his autobiography, which would have been so lauded, and I read it, and I read it in horror, because as he talks about the epiphanies that he would have in the middle of the night, and when he would have an epiphany in the middle of the night, he would round up the Black women whom he kept trapped on his property and enslaved um, in the back of his property, and he would begin uh, lacerating um, their uteruses um, cutting them open, um, stitching, experimenting, and refusing to provide any anesthesia because he was of the belief that Black women didn't feel pain as he tortured their bodies through the middle of the night and into the morning. He became known as the figure to celebrate in the professionalization of gynecology and obstetrics. And it has only been in recent decades that there has been any acknowledgement of the women who suffered through this level of torture that he inflicted on their bodies. But this is a story also about um, the disempowerment of women altogether, not just black women, um, indigenous women and white women in terms of their profession and their trade. Around the time of the civil war, um, and the professionalization of gynecology and obstetrics, what you'll read is that doctors like Horatio Storer and Joseph DeLee, who were also participants in this burgeoning organization, the American Medical Association, were able to use it as a platform to further shut women out of what would become this space that they would monopolize. And part of what they did, it's fascinating to read their pamphlets and their books as they talked about the dirty midwife and that the midwife was bad for medicine and must be shut out. And of course, the only way to get along the path of where they were was in fact to go to medical schools and medical schools barring the admission of women. And also tied to this too, are other practices that they engaged in, which was to try to force along, and they did, um, the requirement of licensure of midwives. If you think about who these women were as midwives, half were black and others were white and indigenous and they were forced out of the profession. But the tool that was used to do it that gained leverage, there were actually two. One was abortion. And that is to say that one of the galvanizing uh, forces that they were able to use is to say these midwives are practicing something very dirty, something very sneaky, something that is immoral, which hadn't been prior to their professionalization. But to use abortion as a wedge in that way, they were quite successful, along with demonizing midwifery um, generally. It's also important to note another tide, and this might make you think about the time in which we're in today. 
which was also the anti-immigration movement that they also fastened themselves to. So the American Medical Association became an organization that was a bit of a mouthpiece for the early men in obstetrics and gynecology, pushing against immigration, pushing against abortion, pushing against um, the inclusion of women. And one final point that I'll make before jumping us into the 20th century is that there was also the very explicit pushing against in terms of race. And this is why the Civil War is important and what's happening at that time. To read the books or pamphlets of Joseph DeLee, Horatio Storer, and others who are following them, they use race in critical ways. They write about the importance of white women using their loins and going all across the country to spread their loins and give birth, right? Sort of speaks to um, the coming kind of um, uh, anti-Black movement after slavery is over, the kind of fear of the country being swamped by Black people, that there would become too many Black people um, who would be free, and the, the need for more white people. Now, of course, it's never panned out. Black people make up about 12% of the population. Black people have never overrun this country in terms of population. But that fear was real at that time and articulated in that way. It was also very interesting, and your audience assumes might get a kick out of this, which is that they were also very insecure about their role vis-a-vis -vis, um, other doctors. The concern being that doctors had told them that um, you're just doing women's work. And so they actually write about this, kind of like defending their honor of doing this, that they're not just like women. They, they have something more to offer than the women midwives did. But there's a final point that I want to make with regard to race, the AMA, and the kind of intersecting of what became um, the sort of reproductive space controlled by obstetrics and gynecology and the men involved in it, which is to say that when Black doctors after the Civil War is over and Black medical schools are developing and they want to become part of the AMA, the organization that is articulating in anti-immigration terms and these others. It's not why they want to join, but they want to be part of the profession. And they are barred from being part of the profession. And the justification that is given at the time is not just their Blackness, but the justification being that Black medical schools did not ban women from being able to attend. So if any of you are wondering why there is a National Medical Association, the National Medical Association was created by Black people who are not able to gain admission into the American Medical Association. These kind of historic intersections really set the stage for then what we see in the early 20th century and to some degree what it is that we see today. And that is to say that by the beginning of the 20th century, there's a wiping away of midwifery. Midwifery goes from being about 100% of what dominates reproductive health care to about 1%. And as well in this space, you see the burgeoning of American eugenics, the earliest American eugenics law being enacted in 1906 in, in Indiana. And by the time that the United States Supreme Court takes up the issue in 1927, eugenics is a strong narrative throughout the United States. And it's one that shapes the reality of this America going forward, or at least what eugenicists would have wanted going forward. It's not just simply anti-Blackness, not at all. It's a kind of anti of anybody that doesn't fit an American ideal of being fit. And so in 1927, the United States Supreme Court takes up the constitutionality of a Virginia law it is a model sterilization law. And the test case involves a young white woman. She is not black. By this time, we already have Jim Crow era laws suppressing and putting black people in their place separate but equal after Plessy v. Ferguson. 
The next agenda is one about poor white people. In Carrie's case, she had been 16, raped by her employer's nephew. She has a child that is out of wedlock. And she is the kind of ideal of what Virginia wants to do away with. Her mother is already institutionalized at a place that Virginia calls the colony. The colony is the place in which they are shutter, shuttering and shuttling the people that they think are unfit, that they want to sterilize. And Carrie's case becomes a test case. Let's be clear that the lawyer who represents her is actually a eugenics sympathizer himself. And the case goes up before the United States Supreme Court in 1927. The honored, the honorable Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, writes the opinion in this case. He famously intones Three generations of imbeciles are enough. He articulates that better than to allow them to starve for their imbecility, society is better off by not allowing people like Carrie to continue their kind. He says that the law of vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. And with that ushers in the era of eugenics in the United States. For many people, when they think about eugenics, they think about Nazi Germany as the place in which eugenics uh, originates. But that is actually not the case. The, the, the law that is adopted by the Third Reich in Nazi Germany is actually based on the Virginia law. And it is at a certain point in which eugenicists and US lawmakers actually say that the Germans are beating us at our own game. If you visit the archives at the Library of Congress, which you can do online, um, and I have done over the, the, the years, visited, been online, plumbed through, and what you'll see, and through other archives, are the ways in which we manifested pushing out then this eugenics agenda in the United States. If you come from the Midwest and you're familiar with state fairs where it's pen the blue ribbon on the favored sheep or the favored cow, then think about this. In the 1920s and 30s in the United States, the fitter family contest at the state fairs. You can see the images of the Fitter family building where the Fitter families were expected to come in and to present their new, their offspring for the contest to see who would have the greatest fitness in the United States. I mean, let's be clear, I should wrap it up that in the Buck B. Bell case, right, the Supreme Court gives a thumbs up to the model uh, Virginia eugenics law and other states then glom on. It's legal now to force the sterilization of people who are considered unfit uh, to continue their kind in the United States, in this country. And what you find is that in states like Virginia and elsewhere, there are girls as young as nine and 10 years old being sterilized so that they will never reproduce. Hollywood even takes this on. The coming attraction in movie theaters ends up being 700 sterilized in the last month in this state, 1,000 sterilized in this state in the last month, 2,000 sterilized in the last month in this state. It has a kind of mean, a kind of intoxicant for a country that is believing that it can be bolder, it can be better, and it can have its own version, its own American version of an Aryan nation. And let us be clear that in Nuremberg, there is a trial not just to ascertain the criminal culpability 
of the military advisors, soldiers, and guards affected, uh, effectively working with the Third Reich or part of the Third Reich, the, the Nazis there. But there was actually a doctor's trial. And this too, not much attention is paid to, but there was an actual doctor's trial in Nazi Germany during Nuremberg. And one of the key defenses that was articulated by the doctors was that they based their practices, now clearly not all of them at all, but based them on US law and US practices, say, you know, on eugenics. But this is what you've done in the United States. How can we be guilty of that when this is something that has been uh, sanctioned by your United States Supreme Court? in 1927, and now here you are um, in the 1940s charging us with the crime of this. And let's be clear, Buck v. Bell has never been overturned. And if we are to understand it as an enterprise that is not just about poor white Americans, then we would understand what Fannie Lou Hamer later talked about in terms of the Mississippi appendectomy, the Rafe sisters and so many more, the way in which sterilization practices then morphed in uh, its application to uh, indigenous women, to women in Puerto Rico, the Mississippi appendectomy being the terminology used, the kind of way of, of doing, um, uh, bringing on a kind of falsity to sort of cover the practice when Black parents would take their daughters in for medical treatment and were told that their daughter, daughters needed to stay a little bit longer because there was the need to address um, an appendectomy. Um, only to find out later that these were uh, girls who were sterilized against their will. And of course, you know, again, we're talking about, um, it shouldn't be, of course, but girls as young as 10, 11, and 12 years old. Now, I know that I've put a lot of content there in terms of laying the groundwork for how we understand policing the womb. I hope that that gives you a, a kind of sense of surveillance as not being just a modern story and iteration, but that it actually has roots and legacies that are entangled in, um, in private spaces, in public spaces, in the legislature, in our courts, in expression to the American public, um, becoming seduced by a notion that there should be certain people who shouldn't be in our society at all. And hopefully, you know, it's understood um, both the race connection and also the um, class connection to these issues as well as setting the stage then for thinking about uh, policing the room. So now let me skip some <laughs> decades with that background um, and to um, talk about what this book um, is about. So this book was a project that I thought would take two years and I'd get it out. Um, I would talk about the sort of status of reproductive health rights and justice in the United States, the growing criminalization um, and mass incarceration of women associated with their pregnancies. Uh, and then I'd be able to tie it up. But along the way, that was not the journey, it was a decade. And I found myself getting deeper and deeper uh, involved I've found myself chairing a task force through Amnesty International, their first one that looked at that intersection of criminalization, mass incarceration, and pregnancy. I found myself um, spending time in Alabama meeting with and talking with prosecutors there in the wake of an Alabama law, a child endangerment statute that was actually intended uh, to uh, be a disincentive for men, basically, in terms of turning their homes into meth laboratories, but instead had been used in the criminalization of women who acknowledged to their medical providers that they had used an illicit substance during pregnancy. I found myself uh, retelling the stories that Dorothy Roberts uh, told and then expanding upon them 
in terms of the criminalization of black women during the 1980s and 90s under euphemistically called crack baby mama laws. And these laws were criminal, but they were also civil with some states providing for the forced um, uh, incarceration, civil incarceration of women um, so long as a medical provider believed that they pose some form of harm to um, their fetuses. And of course, finding out that in those states, while legal protections were provided for their fetuses, such as lawyers being provided for fetuses, none being provided for these women in these civil uh, commitment cases. And then expanding from there, finding the cases of women um, being threatened with arrest for refusing cesarean section uh, in the United States. And that this was not episodic, but that actually one could begin to see patterns across the country involving this. And then also layering onto that, seeing the way in which legislators were beginning uh, to, um, to basically undermine the end of life decision making of pregnant women, overriding, overturning medical directives, these called pregnancy exclusion laws, all of these various spaces stitching together in a broad and complicated, and if not chilling and horrific kind of a quilt, and add it to that, then the attacks on abortion rights, and connect it with that something else that I could not turn away from seeing, which was the growing maternal mortality rate in the United States. And let me say this um, about that. Um, the United States now leads the developed world, and I put air quotes around that, um, in terms of mat maternal mortality. Texas and Louisiana are considered the deadliest places in the, de in the developed world for a woman to be pregnant. The United States ranks around 50th, 51st in the world in terms of maternal mortality. If you think about it in this way, it is because of the rates, and, and this you can find on the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency website, they actually keep these statistics. Uh, it's safer to give birth in Bosnia and Saudi Arabia than it is in the United States. Black women are nearly four times more likely to die through childbirth in this United States than are their white counterparts. But that's a national statistics. Once you actually go to Mississippi and Georgia and parts of Louisiana, that rate multiplies. It can be 10 times as likely, 17 times as likely to die during uh, labor, childbirth, post-delivery than their white counterparts. One must then ask, what is happening in the United States? And the same kind of question that we would ask during Jim Crow, we could say that this is a Jane Crow period and give a nod to Polly Murray for that terminology for what it is that is happening, but that we may not be see seeing. And so what policing the womb seeks to do is to render visible that which has been made invisible. Um, in the United States. And so I want to provide the, I'm going to give myself the opportunity to actually read a little bit uh, from the book to further share with you uh, what it is that I'm talking about here. So let me say this as I foreground a little bit of, you know, reading from the book. We now have ways in which law has become quite dynamic. For those of you who teach in the first year who are on here, and for those of you who are students in the first year, you know that you know American law is somewhat arcane. We still teach cases from the 1700s and 1800s and property and contracts and tort law. We know that the doctrinal tradition is to build upon prior iterations of law and to add nuance, sometimes to completely repeal, right? That's Brown v. Board of Education in conversation with Plessy. But the thing that is fascinating in this space is the innovation, the way in which law has become an innovative tool in the oppression of women through reproduction. The sort of making of new laws between 2010 and 2013, there were more anti-abortion and anti-contraceptive laws 
that were enacted and proposed than in the 30 years prior combined. And this kind of new wave of lawmaking um, is not just with regard to abortion and not just with regard to abortion and uh, making no exceptions in case of rape and incest, but it is also laws providing for the criminalization of conduct during pregnancy. You see lawmakers uh, proposing laws that could lead to the death penalty for women um, who engage in a conduct which they find offensive during pregnancy, for life sentences for women who get engage in conduct that they find uh, offensive or impermissible uh, during pregnancy. These kind of draconian responses uh, to women and their bodies. And this is all kind of new lawmaking in the works. And then you find courts responding in ways like the Alabama Supreme Court. And Alabama figures importantly here, because as I've mentioned, the Alabama child endangerment law, what you find is that, you know, if we look at these issues from the 1980s and 90s, we can say that black women and brown women were the canaries in the coal mine, because in Alabama, of the women caught in the trap of the child endangerment law there, of the more than 500 that have been arrested um, and of those many taking plea deals, uh, what you find is that they're predominantly white, but they're all poor for the most part, poor and working class, right? These women who've been ensnared in that. And what you find is a kind of new rulemaking coming out of courts as well, such as the Alabama Supreme Court saying, we see no difference um, in a non-viable fetus and a viable fetus. And we see no difference in a viable fetus and a child, right? All of that is kind of new rulemaking that's taking place then uh, within courts. So let me just turn uh, very quickly to two passages um, that are in the book and then I'll open up for uh, Q&A. And there's so much more, the book covers a number of spaces and I'll just give you some you know, backdrop. Uh, it includes uh, pregnancy and state power, the kind of prosecuting a fetal endangerment, the creeping criminalization of pregnancy across the United States, abortion, the changing roles of doctors and nurses, creating hospital snitches of uh, and police informants of doctors and nurses. It sort of brings into question um, the fiduciary relationship in a space in which the state applies pressure to doctors and nurses to be their eyes behind the scenes. And it creates criminals of poor women creating stereotypes and collateral damage for their children. And it brings about a pregnancy penalty and also policing beyond the border. And we see that in the detention centers where there have been allegations of women in immigrant detention centers who've been coercively um, sterilized. In the book, in the chapter five, Changing Roles of Doctors and Nurses, Hospital Snitches and Police Informants, I talk about the case of, uh, of a grandmother, Barbara Dawson. And Barbara Dawson was actually not a person who was pregnant at all, um, but she's a person whose story fits within this medical space that I wanted to talk about and I open with talking about uh, being in Paris and giving a talk in Paris and the audience members being people who are from all around the world, but a couple of people being from the United States. And perhaps it resonates given that Breonna Taylor, the anniversary of Breonna Taylor's death, um, her killing was just three days ago and it's coming up on George Floyd's. And so in this, I talk about the case of Barbara Dawson and about a video that I had wanted to show, but the video was actually not working. And let me just share just a little bit with you and I'll share another passage and then we can open up for Q&A. So I described how Miss Dawson, a 57 year old black woman died pleading and gasping right outside the Calhoun Liberty Hospital in Blountstown, Florida shortly before Christmas in 2015. She pleaded to keep the oxygen mask that allowed her to breathe 
In some sense, there is nothing extraordinary about the image of Miss Dawson or the interactions of hospital and officer, which further complicates their deadly interaction. It is far too normal, poor people at the behest and mercy of nurses and doctors, black women fearing for their health and safety when they do not seek care and troublingly, even when they do. When I first saw a photo of Ms. Dawson cloaked in her red church hat and Sunday clothes, it reminded me of the sepia-hued images of Southern Black grandmothers lined up for church. The hat perfectly crests on her head and her eyes directly meet the camera uh, with that look of no time for foolishness. All of that seemed normal, just as ordinary as being transported to a hospital in an ambulance complaining of severe pain and expecting to receive care but also just as common as the fear and risk of being denied appropriate medical services and turned away in the United States if you are poor and a woman of color. Numerous studies confirm unequal healthcare treatment in the United States, chief amongst them, the Federal Institute of Medicine's voluminous treaties on the subject, unequal treatment confronting racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. However, the personal accounts shed attention in ways that raw numbers and important st statistics simply do not. Police dash cam and other audio recordings, as well as the Blountstown Police Department transcript, capture this interaction. Officer Tadlock says, you can either walk out of here peacefully or I can take you out of here. Miss Dawson panting while the officer calmly enforce, informs her of those terribly constrained options Notably, neither includes giving her the oxygen she needs. She fitfully calls on God. Tadlock then reaches to remove her oxygen mask. He says, let's take this off. Dawson responds, you can't take that off. My students are sometimes confused because of how they should understand this. Officer Tadlock speaks in calm almost entreating ways and voice. For many of them, this is not what racism sounds like. Miss Dawson, some of them say, is loud. When Miss Dawson refuses to surrender the mask, hospital staff gesture to the wall, informing Officer Tadlock that the oxygen supply hose could be disconnected from the port located there. He does so. He disconnects the hose. Afterwards, Miss Dawson wails, leave me alone, leave me alone. I can't even breathe. I beg you. Her options were limited. There was not much the grandmother could do but beg, in essence, for her life. Within a short while, she would be dead. In his police report, Officer Tadlock describes his efforts to handcuff and arrest Miss Dawson for disorderly conduct and trespass for refusing to leave the Calhoun Liberty Hospital. He writes that she was nonviolent, but also non-compliant. At this time, I placed handcuffs on Dawson's left hand and attempted to place it behind her back. After a brief struggle with multiple verbal attempts to get Dawson to place her hand behind her back, I was able to get her left hand behind her back. Because she was able to plead for oxygen, Tadlock and hospital staff deduced that Miss Dawson was not having trouble breathing. The report details the use of a male hospital staff member to pull Miss Dawson's right arm behind her back in order to complete cuffing her. It explains Miss Dawson's forcible removal from the hospital, including Tadlock pushing her from behind to get her to go with him to the patrol car, and the cuts and bruises on her feet and knees as she collapsed by the back door of the police car. Officer Dawson reprimands Miss Dawson. He says, falling down like this and laying down, that's not going to stop you from going to jail. Someone, maybe another officer, assures one of Miss Dawson's family members, she's okay. One voice on the recording says, come now, there ain't nothing wrong with you. And another, another officer says, you are going to jail one way or the other. There is a photograph of the slumped Mrs. Dawson next to the police car. Her life ended on the pavement, feet away from the entrance of the hospital that phoned the police on their patient because she refused to leave. She lay there nearly 20 minutes before being pronounced dead. 
Calhoun Liberty Hospital concedes that she died from a blood clot in her lungs. According to records obtained by the New York Times, she, the hospital phoned police regarding their patient more than a dozen times in the year that she died. All right, very quickly, I'll just read another passage and then we're on to Q&A. So this is from the introduction to the book. This is not a work of fiction, although I wish it were. Some of the cases described here could recall the imagery evoked by Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, who tells a horror story about a young rogue scientist who creates an unsightly monster through clandestine aberrant experimentation. Although Frankenstein is the name of the monster's creator, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, readers would be forgiven for debating who the real monster happens to be. In Policing the Womb, the story of Marlise Munoz comes to mind, brain dead decomposing in a Texas hospital, forced by a state legislation to gestate a barely developing fetus while her body decays and the anomalies in the fetus mount. Eventually, it is reported that the fetus is hydrocephalic, which means severe brain damage, in this case, and water or fluid developing on its brain. Medical reports also show that the fetus is not developing in its lower extremities. The state knows brain death is irreversible. The hospital forces Marlise's dead body to shake, placing it on a bed that constantly and violently moves, which makes the dead woman's eyes flap open and shut. Likely frightening to some hospital staff, they decide to tape Marlise's eyes shut. Even if Marlise could see anything, which is unlikely because she is dead, now no one needs to look into her eyes to search for any signs of life. If the state believes, despite well-accepted medical science, that she is alive, it is now taken away her sight and forced her into a state of blindness while her body is poked and prodded. Marlise's shaking corpse stays hydrated through tubes that bring fluids into the body. Somehow the hospital finds a way to pipe away the waste. Everyone, including the state, agrees that really she is an incubator. This is why the Texas law exists. This is not the novel The Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian opus written by Margaret Atwood, made exceedingly relevant today. The shaking bed is not in the totalitarian fictional state of Gilead. No, this is Texas. This is why the state forces machines to be attached to Marlise's body to keep her organs functioning until they give out. The machines are not keeping her alive. They are simply keeping her organs viable. This is why the hospital cleaves into her body with slicing, lacerating, and stitching tools. This is why it tapes her eyes shut, pumps her with fluid, and then drains other liquids from what remains of her. Her decaying has nothing to do with senescence or aging. Rather, it is the typical decomposition characteristic of brain death cases. Hoses, pipes, and cylinders serve as the conduits between the state and Marlise's decaying body. This is known as mechanical support. The hospital cuts a hole into Marlise's neck to create an opening in the trachea. She will receive a tracheotomy. The widower, Eric, objects. This is desecration of Marlise's body. The hospital must be used to ignoring Eric's objections. He said no and objected to the second resuscitation attempt. The hospital did it anyway. He sits there daily as her light brown skin transitions from supple to hard, like a mannequin, Marlise's father said. Her body loses muscle tone and begins to smell. Eric comments on the smell. That smell lingers. It's not the smell of Marlise's favorite perfume. It's not the smell of flowers from the tidy hospital gift shop. No, the smell that fills the room and Eric's nostrils and those of anyone who visits the room is that of a rotting body. No one except perhaps the select group of anti-abortion protesters outside is confused about this. Marlise is dead. Outside, someone tells a filmmaker, Rebecca Hamowitz, just give Marlise a week 
He said, you'll see. A week or two will turn all of this around, he says. This particular protester captured in Hamowitz's documentary, 62 Days, actually travels to cases like this. She told me he's like a professional at this. A thought comes to mind. Sleeping Beauty, the 1959 animated musical produced by Walt Disney. It's based on the 17th century French fairy tale by Charles Perrault. In the fairy tale, a beautiful princess is forced into a hypnotic slumber. The spell she is under will only be broken by a magical kiss of the prince. The prince will awaken her. However, Marlise's real life prince, Eric, does not harness this magic. Or perhaps the state has dethroned Eric. But if that's the case, who is the new prince? The Texas legislature? In any case, Eric Munoz lacks any special powers to rouse Marlise, despite what the protester outside the hospital claims. In fact, Eric no longer has rights over his wife's body until the state is satisfied with Marlise's gestation and cuts open her body to remove the fetus. It turns out that marriage and the rights of next of kin mean very little when the state takes control of a pregnant woman's body in order to protect the fetus. The state refers to this as fetal protection. In this case, the state is protecting the fetus from Marlise's husband and her parents who say, let her rest in peace. The hospital serves as a surrogate or an agent of the state. This is not a role that staff have asked for, but some may fear the consequences if they do not follow the state's legislation. The medical staff know that she is dead, but they must follow the Texas law, which ignores death, do not resuscitate orders, medical directives, and living wills only if the patient is pregnant. Thank you very much for allowing me to give this lecture today. And now I think we can have some Q&A. All right, well, thank you so much for those uh, really compelling remarks, Dr. Goodwin. And we actually have a queue that's been populated with some really uh, interesting questions. And so the first question that I would like to raise for you is, um, Back to your topic on eugenics and, and the history of eugenics that you shared with us vis-a-vis uh, -vis Buck v. Bell. The, the question from the audience is that uh, Justice Thomas in a recent decision used some of that shameful eugenics history to suggest that abortion bans based on field disability may be constitutional. And it seems ironic to the questioner that he would use the past coercion of women to further coerce women, uh, but there's some nuance in that that we're hoping that that maybe you could draw out for us. Yes, that's the box case. And <clears throat> Justice <clears throat> Thomas, um, I, you know, I, I remember taking my daughter to uh, to Supreme Court uh, to the Supreme Court to, to hear cases when she was nine. She's, she's now twenty six, and she remarked at the time that Justice Thomas appeared to be asleep, and he was. It appeared to be that way. Maybe he was just listening with his eyes closed. And what I like to say now is that he, Justice Thomas is awake. He may not be woke, but he is awake. <laughs> <clears throat> and so um, this has been um, an area in which Justice Thomas has leaned in, but so have anti-abortionists with laws that are named after Frederick Douglass, believe it or not, right? So sort of anti-abortion laws are being named after um, people who fought for the freedom, equality, autonomy of Black people to be able to have control over their own bodies. And now in a very coercive type of way, uh, reframing those individuals and their legacies in service of work that is decidedly anti-autonomy of Black women and their bodies. And this is why history is actually very important because Justice Thomas does use the language of eugenics um, as a way of framing what he describes as um, the access to abortion that black women would otherwise have. Because let's be clear, these are not instances in which states are forcing black women uh, to have uh, abortions at all, but instances in which black women are making the decisions and anybody else making the decisions 
um, based in interesting ways on what was articulated in Roe v. Wade. In Roe v. Wade, Justice Blackmun talked about how unwanted uh, childbirth, um, how, um, how it could interfere with one's education, one's career, one's physical health, one's mental health. These were all made clear and supported by and have been uh, by numerous research, right? Um, and so what's interesting in this space is to flip all of what we understand about, um, even just as I've talked about the dangers of childbirth as they are for black women. A person is 14 times more likely to die, this is general, by carrying a pregnancy to term than by terminating it. In any other category, I would imagine that where there is a constitutional right, the state would not coercively involve itself in trying to make sure you did not have that option that was actually safer for your life as it does in these particular instances. And to just put more fact there, the World Health Organization has long said that an abortion is as safe as a penicillin shot. And it is, it's one of the safest medical procedures that anybody could have. But if you lean into the rhetoric that is described in this space, you would think that by choosing to terminate a pregnancy for whatever reason it is, that that would be something that would cost the state significant dollars. You would think that it would be the worst decision that a person could make for medical purposes rather than understanding it as one of the safest uh, decisions that a person could make who becomes pregnant. So I do see this as a means of subterfuge in the way in which Justice Thomas uses his rhetoric here, comparing access to terminate a pregnancy or abortion to genocide. Thank you for that question. Um, I wanna come back around to the, that double speak because you've raised the sort of double speak of, of Thomas's decisions. And even when you were giving us that narrative about Mrs. Dawson from your text, the double speak of, well, wait, what does racism sound like? So I wanna circle back to that. We have this really great question though from one of our law students that I wanna share with you. Uh, the student asks, is it fair to say that the policing of reproduction operates as a dual system of eugenics and criminalization by way of sterilization operating simultaneously with fetal protection, right? So we have this ending of life and forcing of life. And so there's a contradiction in there. Is it reconciled through the end goal of just reproductive control or what is uh, the thing that's sort of upstream of that? What is, is there something more nuanced or insidious that's, that's embedded in that subtext? And if you could speak to that. So what a really great think. question, right? So what's insidious and what's baked into this is when, when private actors or the state uh, gains control over an individual's ability to be able to direct her own healthcare. That's what's insidious, right? I, and we see that as insidious in the sterilization platforms of um, the eugenics era in the United States and the post-eugenics era in the United States where uh, doctors um, who were working for the state engaged in sterilizations um, with their patients who were on Medicaid. Right, you know, hence black women being swept into this or hence even in the state of California, it being revealed in recent years <clears throat> how medical doctors working with women who were incarcerated coercively um, sterilizing women without their knowledge and the litigation that took place afterwards and the efforts to try to change state laws, right? So there is a distinction between someone being vested in the wholeness and dignity of her personhood um, and being able to make those decisions independently and autonomously versus the state using the uterus as a euphemistic football for whatever its ends and means happen to be. And that is the space that we're in now. It's very interesting that, um, to go back to Justice Thomas, that we don't have a lean in in terms of what the culpability of the state, the coercion of the state in terms of 
uh, immigrant detention and using sterilization as a tool there. But Justice Thomas is very willing to lean in about why uh, Black women shouldn't be accorded the opportunity to make decision make to make decisions over their own reproductive health and autonomy. Essentially, it really should be state take your hands off of the bodies of people who have uteri. Take your hands off. Allow people to make these decisions, informed decisions for themselves about their bodies. And with so much at stake, you know, that, that self-autonomy and that uh, ability to be free from state intervention, the, the rhetoric that you've talked about and that some of the questions have, have uh, elucidated is, you know, it's really difficult to cut through when they're using the language of one thing to talk about taking away the rights of someone else, when you're using that really calm voice to then use uh, state force in this really racist way that had uh, a life altering context in the anecdote that you shared with us. How do we push through that? How do we learn how to navigate that space when even just the rhetoric is being used to confound the narrative when there's this larger social justice issue at stake that we need to, to ag aggressively preserve? <clears throat> So there is a saying, uh, which some in your audience may be familiar with, which is that the tale, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter until the lion has its say, right? That is to say, who gets to control the narrative, right? Who gets to share the in information, right? Who gets to tell the story of history? Who gets to tell the narratives about women's body, the sort of DNA trapped within the body? Who gets to tell um, Margaret Garner's story, who gets to tell the story of Sally Hemings, right? Like if one were to dive into another space of this to, to get at this really important question that you've asked, it's not until after um, the race riot in Charlottesville, the rise of the sort of like white supremacists who, who come into Charlottesville and the death of Heather Heyer and all of the horror of, around that, that then another important story to American history is revealed. So, um, and that is to say, um, Sally Hemings, who bore at least six children by Thomas Jefferson, her room at Monticello had literally been papered over, <clears throat> pardon me, as a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Sally Hemings had been taken out of the narrative um, about this kind of race and sex uh, policing, assault, rape, whatever one, you know, however one describes what that was by this American president. And by papering over her story, there are many things that are papered over. There was the papering over the fact that she was the biological half-sister of his wife, right? So another race rape story. The papering over the fact that she had been a 13-year-old girl when he decides that he needs to travel with her and take her to Paris and come back with this agreement that uh, according to their legacy, his legacy, that uh, she will be the mother of his children. Papers over the story that a man who loved windows and if you visit Monticello, there are windows everywhere except the place where she was confined next to his bedroom where there are no windows and what this story means. So after Charlottesville, there is the exhuming of Sally Hemings in terms of the imagination or the reality of Monticello. Who gets to tell the story and when does the story get to be told and how does that help us to understand who we are as a people, as a country, as people who are part of the politic and politics of reproduction in the United States. And all of these pieces are important if we are to understand with nuance what you're driving at and to get where we need to be. And I want to add another piece to that, which is that I think it's really important that we understand Roe v. Wade as that seven to two opinion with five Republican justices saying, let's decriminalize abortion. It's important to understand that Prescott Bush, who's the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. It's important to understand that in 1966, Dr. King receives the inaugural Margaret Sanger Award from Planned Parenthood, and the speech that he writes is, is amazing. It's delivered by Coretta Scott King because Dr. King is off being arrested someplace, and she says how important it is for her to deliver that speech, how proud she was to deliver the speech, and what's in the speech. Dr. King talks about how, I mean, talking about intersectionality, he says the civil rights movement is aligned with the women's rights movements. 
He said it is cruel to force people into pregnancies that they do not want, into parenthood that they do not want and that they cannot afford. He talks about what was common in an agrarian economy of having 10 children to help farm is unsustainable in Jim Crow, in freedom. When you move into a city and you're living in a one bedroom, two bedroom tenement, it's unsustainable to have that number of kids. And cruel is the language that he used. Mm -hmm. He says that family planning is something that is important. Now, I want to also add that there's nuance to the discussions that are taking place in the 1960s and 70s around family planning. But let us be clear, for the Justice Thomases and others who would like to re-narrate history, I say read Dr. King's 1966 speech where he talks about the fundamental importance of women being able to control their own reproductive destinies and how he connects economics with the freedom to family plan and decide the size of family that one wants. And to just be clear that this wasn't just about a great night for Coretta Scott King, you will find, and I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants a copy, Dr. King actually followed up writing an additional letter to Planned Parenthood, underscoring how important it was that uh, he received that award and what he believed in this. And, and let me make one final point, and I know we got other questions, which is that in that same year after this speech, when Dr. King is asked, why is it that you have spoken about these other issues about women and family planning, about poverty and whatnot. We thought you were just about race and the South. And Dr. King said this in 1966. He said, I refuse to segregate my moral concerns. Mm -hmm. He saw this as a moral concern. So anyway, enough of me pontificating on that. No, that was wonderful. That was really uh, illuminating. And uh, another question that comes from our audience kind of brings us into the present day with uh, the COVID pandemic that we've all been living under and a lot of uh, the concerns uh, in the Black community of having been disproportionately harmed and now disproportionately underserved by access to the vaccine, but also this history of, of abuse and, and mistreatment from the medical establishment has created this atmosphere of mistrust around the vaccination. And so we were wondering if you could speak a bit about the concerns that Black Americans have been voicing in, in different ways about their reluctance to engage with the COVID vaccine and, and what you would recommend uh, should be done to, to correct that. So um, <clears throat> two points that I'd like to make with regard to that. So um, what's interesting, but for different reasons, um, we see levels of mistrust <laughs> between white people and Black people that almost match, but in different ways, right? So there is a anti-vaxxer movement uh, that has been white, white uh, led by more affluent white folks with, you know, their children. So there is that, which is actually separate uh, from the concerns that Black people have had over time in the failure of a justice system to recognize the harms that have befallen African Americans and medical systems, right? So there is a wonderful documentary, The Power to Heal. I commend it all to you to see. It's a fabulous documentary and it tracks the struggle, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, President um, uh, Johnson had in trying to get Medicaid through. Um, he succeeds, but what it reveals is this history of racism and medical care in the United States. I've talked about Dr. Marion Sims, but I could equally, we could equally dive into my first book, Black Markets, which speaks to how black people had to hire guards over their cemeteries because of medical schools pillaging black bodies from cemeteries for um, medical schools anatomy classes. And the uh, hiring of guards was to sort of protect the, their deceased loved ones being able to rest, you know, eternally uh, in peace. Whether it's that, the human uh, medical experimentation, you know, we don't even have to talk about Tuskegee, but we should. There's been a long legacy far beyond Tuskegee. People typically tip into Tuskegee, but there's more before Tuskegee 
and after Tuskegee, whether we're talking about lead studies involving Johns Hopkins um, Medical School, whether we're talking about course of HIV studies involving children and um, foster care in New York. I mean, we could like pitter patter all across the country. I've written about this. So there would be ample reason for black people to be concerned about coercion in medical care. And there would be ample reason for black people to be turned off from medical care having been pushed away. The story of COVID is an interesting one because it reveals underlying institutional and infrastructural problems in our society. You know, one of the things that I began tracking at the beginning of COVID were the number of child deaths due to COVID because it was a space in which the articulations were children won't die. We can be fine not worrying about children, but who were the children that were dying? There were black and brown children. And what was interesting is that these were not genetic cases. It's quite frustrating when people want to build, you know, live in a race and say it's genetic and race is actually something that's social political. Right. When you read those cases, what you find is that there were parents who actually time and time again, tried to get care and help for their kids and were turned away, turned away, turned away. So you have a couple of things. You've got the frustrations of the past and mistrust. You got histories of being turned away and all of that in a kind of frustrating space about, you know, as to what to do now. My advice, get vaccinated. It's important to do so, but I also think that it's important to ignore what these histories mean and that people are not being um, illogical. They're not, being, um, um, they're, they're not engaged in hysterics when they say, see our pain, see what has happened to black people in, medical, in the medical setting. I think it's important to acknowledge it and that we find the ways to build trust and move forward. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I want to take us a little bit back to the issue of policing and, and criminalization of pregnant women. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about uh, the way that incarcerated women uh, who are pregnant have been treated. Um, what is the condition of their care? What are some of the stories that need to be brought to light about the treatment of incarcerated pregnant women? Well, let me tell you that very recently, I suffered the loss of a very close friend, Sue Ellen Allen, and she's the founder and president of Reinventing Reentry. And I met Sue Ellen originally through some research that one of my research assistants uh, had done. She'd come across this op-ed that Sue Ellen had written about going into prison with breast cancer and how she was shackled and chained, kept in a, a holding cell with, you know, rats, roaches, it was horrible. And then being shackled and chained while she had the double mastectomy. <clears throat> and then how it was women who were behind bars who provided her the support that she was actually supposed to get. So how she was, um, how she was supposed to have a pillow in order to prevent the atrophy of her of muscles, but how the hospital, how the prison refused to do that. And so secretly um, the women in prison uh, took their sanitary napkins and um, and made a pillow for her. And because they knew she had been kind of fancy before going into prison, she was there for a fraud, um, they made fringe on it. But she talks about how they saved her life. And that entry into sort of Sue Wellen and joining the board of the organization that she had founded, Gina's team, took me into prisons and jails and detention centers. And I began to be able to see close up front just what medical neglect looks like. And in Sue Ellen's case, it wasn't bad enough what it had. She had a 25 year old mate, mother of four kids who was in jail for on a drug offense. Gina practically died in her arms. She did die. Mm -hmm. um, Gina had been complaining of severe headaches, of uh, when she chewed, it felt like glass was penetrating her mouth. Um, hospital um, or medical <laughs> jail officials <laughs> refused uh, to even um, make sure that she had a blood test to see what was going on. On the day in which they finally uh, took her temperature, she was running a high fever and they gave her a blood test. She lapsed into a coma on the very day where they finally gave her medical attention and she died three days later, undiagnosed leukemia. I can tell you that every one of our meetings was like a painful day because it was at the time of our meetings where we were getting phone calls from the relatives of people who were incarcerated, women who were incarcerated, 
telling us about a death, about a woman dying in her vomit, about a woman giving birth in a prison toilet or on a concrete floor, about so many cases of medical neglect, about how women's prisons, unlike what people may think, um, are incredibly dilapidated. Um, and now, sadly, what's also happening is that for good behavior, your children get to, the child might get to stay with you for a few years behind bars. Um, the, the unfortunate part about that is that, um, you know, the United States incarcerates more women than any other country in the world, more than China, Russia, India, Thailand, all combined. And this kind of feature of the intersection of policing, reproduction, and, and women are the fastest growing population incarcerated through, you know, nonviolent drug offenses. Um, and what is happening is that there is a cohort, there is a slice of that, that are exactly the women that I'm talking about in this book. Um, these are the women who tell their medical provider, I took a Valium during my pregnancy. You know, they tell their medical provider, yeah, I use this kind of drug and I need help. And their medical providers becoming snitches or, you know, um, a term that Paul Bowler gave me some years ago um, of their patients. And these women end up behind bars without the care that they need. And not to be too long on this question, but, but I'm, I appreciate you giving me to answer it. And my interviews with prosecutors, you know, one brave prosecutor um, disclosed to me and shared with me that, you know, she thinks it's the wrong answer, right? Um, the, the sort of criminalization of these women who are admitting to using some illicit drug during their pregnancy, because she said, you know, they might be using one illicit drug during their pregnancy when they're out, but when they get behind bars, it's like a candy store. If you were the state and you really wanted to help them, then you know provide a diversion into treatment. But if you don't provide that diversion into treatment, you have actually put them in an envir environment where they can get all sorts of drugs behind bars. And when they come out, the recidivism rate is incredibly high. And so research does show that um, it does work providing people rehabilitative services. It's far more effective. Um, for people's lives and economically than it is putting them behind bars. On that important and powerful note, I'm gonna uh, ask our audience to sort of join me in giving a virtual round of applause for our speaker, Dr. Michelle Batcher Goodwin. Her book is Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood. If you haven't gotten it, go get it you will be, it's time well spent. Uh, you'll enjoy reading and learning so much about the important issues that we've just sort of gotten a taste of today. Dr. Goodwin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your insights and thank you for sharing your research and your work and your mission with all of us. We really appreciate hearing from you. It's been my honor. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you for your brilliant moderation and your generous introduction. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Bye now.